What's good? It's your boy for nine. All right, man, you know the story. <laughs> you know the story we've been covering, we've been talking about for months now. And I don't even care, man. I'm going to cover this stuff because I find it fun at this point in time. I hope you listen to the video. If you're tired of the subject, I can appreciate that, man. But I find this stuff intriguing. And this back and forth between Steven Espinoza and Eddie Earn, to me, it's just, it's absolutely hilarious, man. Now, before I get into this, and and Steven Espinoza, the short of it is, es- Steven Espinoza just, you can hear the irritation in his voice when he's doing this. <laughs> you can hear his irritation through his, uh, through the wit- written word. And his back and forth with, uh, his back and forth with Eddie Hearn, man, is to me, I find it very funny because Eddie Hearn, I mean, because Steven Espinoza, give you a little background on Steven Espinoza. Steven Espinoza is a lawyer. And Steven, I think he went to, I don't know if he went to Stanford Law or whatever, but he got out. I know that he got out around the same time that I got out of, got out of law school. So I know that he's been around. He's been around for a long time. He's the former chief counsel for Golden Boy Promotions. He also used to work for, I can't remember the name of the firms that he worked for, but he also worked for, uh, I think he also did like, excuse me, an agent, a sports agent. And he also wound up, I do believe, working for a law firm that was involved with, with sports related uh, with sports related clients. So Steven Espinoza is an expert on the subject, right? And if you do the math on it, he got out of law school in 96, right? So 96 was uh 22 years ago he's been working in this for 22 years specifically on subjects like this i think eddie hearn might be 38 years old so 22 years ago what was he 16 years old something like that so (laughs) steven espinoza has been actively working in this area since eddie hearn was 16 years old and they have this back and forth to me, man. And this really is like, it really is like, you know, somebody talking to a child. Because Stephen Espinoza says, responds to Eddie Hearn with, you know, I'm responding to Eddie Hearn respi- responds to, we'll catch it in the middle of the conversation saying, you know, I'm responding to one, I'm responding to comments that proof of funds were provided. No, they weren't. Two, Eddie Hearn says, I've asked for a contract that was flat out refused. Three, does Deontay Wilder have a contract with, with Showtime? <laughs> Four, good night. Right now, Eddie Hearn's thinking he's being smart, right? <laughs> Steven Espinosa comes back with one fact. Wilder provided, uh, offered to provide security and you didn't respond. Now, let's go back to this. This is just a fact. Now, Eddie Hearn says in this tweet, I'm responding to comments that proof of funds were provided. No, they weren't. Now, didn't Eddie Hearn, isn't this the same guy that said that he was asking for proof of funds, but then he never did ask for proof of funds? But Steven Espinosa says Wilder offered proof of, uh, proof of security and you didn't respond at all. He said he asked for a contract. Number two, I asked for a contract that was flat out refused. Steven Espinosa said, fact, the term shit. The term sheet was sent and you saw it now to quibble a little bit because I didn't actually see the term sheet. Term sheets can be legally binding or they cannot be legally binding. A lot of times they're not legally binding because it pretty much is like akin to a letter of intent. Right. Where you say what you're intending to do. I say what I'm intending to do. But um, but if it's found that you guys intended to be bound legally bound by that agreement, then it can be legally binding. Right. So, but anyway, the fun, the funny part that it winds up ha- saying, man, and then, uh, cause Eddie Hearn is gets on the, uh, bronze bomber, right. Respi- replies to the bronze bomber. Deontay Wilder says, sign the contract. Steven Espinosa says nobody signs a first drive draft of a contract, especially on a big fight. Surely, you know, that, or is it your first international pay-per-view? Oh, sorry. It is your first. You'll learn eventually. Like, you're a dummy. <laughs> but here's the thing, man. I like what he said about this, about the contract. Deontay, does Deontay Wilder have a contract? 
Steven Espinosa says Deontay Wilder has something more important than a contract. He has loyalty. Are you familiar with the concept? I don't think so. Now, here is the thing, man. If you do not trust somebody and somebody has not kept their word to you, then you should have everything that they say and do written down if you absolutely positively have to deal with them. And even if you do have something that's written down, if you don't trust that person, that contract and that agreement isn't written the paper that is wor- uh, that is written on because you're going to wind up having to, they're going to break their word. More than likely, they're going to breach. You can't trust that they're going to, they're not going to breach the contract. And then you're going to have to go through all kind of litigation and all kind of do- drama to fix that. Now, I wouldn't advise anybody to sign a to sign the first draft of a contract unless they have no leverage. Now, if you don't have any leverage, then a lot of times people do sign the first drafts of contracts. If you buy a phone from Sprint and you want to get a you want to get a service contract, a lot of times people are just going to sign that agreement because you versus Sprint, you have no leverage. And Sprint will just say, okay, well, thank you very much. Go on over there to AT&T and see if you like their terms better. You know, they can't force you to sign it, but also, you know, they more than likely are not going to be editing their term and conditions for your $102, for your $102 a month that they're pulling in for that. It would probably cost, the, it, that's not in their interest to do that. But in most scenarios, 99.9% of them, where you have people that have equal leverage or even remotely similar leverage, even if it's the A side, (laughs) even if you can consider somebody to be the A side, I hate that term, but they're still going to say, okay, let me read through this. Let me give you, let me ask you some questions. Where's the, where's the bout going to be? When is the bout going to be? Why is there just a one-sided rematch clause? Why am I, okay, I see this thing, and I always point to these clauses like an indemnification clause, right? Why do I have to defend you if something goes wrong with this? You know, all those type of things, man. Whenever you see a contract written, that's going to be written in a way that is defending the interest, that really looks out for the interest of the person that's making the offer, Right? And it's up to you to read that, understand what they're saying, and then try to bring some balance to the equation by making, by bringing up certain points, seeing what they're willing to give, what they're not willing to give. And if you can reach an agreement, if you can reach a, uh, a middle, if you can reach a middle ground, then you, then you go, there's always going to be some amount of negotiation or there should be, there is going to be an amount of negotiation when it's two parties. When it's two parties that both have, that both need one another and want to do business with one another. The only time when somebody's just going to give you a contract and you're just going to sign it without any saying anything is if you have absolutely no other choices and you have no leverage in the, no, have no leverage in that situation whatsoever. Akin to, like I said, the situation where you might sign, you know, a contract with um, Verizon, right? Or, and you're like, ah, well, I just want to get it done. I know I can't argue with them about, right, payment terms, you know, it being due once a month versus being due every three months or whatever. You can't really, you just don't have any leverage with them. So you go on ahead and sign it, right? But anyway, man, this is the, Eddie Hearn, man, is just, to me, this whole loyalty thing, this whole conversation that he's going, I, that's going on, I really do believe that, Eddie Hearn never intended to make this bout. And there was actually, and I think I might link this, uh, this article to the, uh, to my community tab, not an article, it's a video that somebody did. And it's a chance. This is where I think that, that Eddie Hearn is really doing uh, Anthony Joshua a disservice. If his intention really is to make this bout and to make Anthony Joshua into an inter- international superstar, because truthfully, I mean, Just being honest, man, he's not an international superstar unless by that you mean he's popular in Great Britain and uh, in France or, you know, he knows some people in Dubai in Great Britain. He's a domestic product right now. And to the extent that he has any name recognition in the United States, it came it's coming from the people that he's art that he's currently arguing with with right now. But 
there was a uh, the reason I say that I think that he's doing it a disservice, man, is because Anthony Joshua has the same fan base. He has the same potential fan base as Deontay Wilder in the United States. And there was a, the article that I mean, excuse me, the video. I'm not going to say the name of the guy's page because I'm not a fan of his page. And quite honestly, man, I think this dude is, uh, you know, he's a let's put it this way. He's a supporter of Sergey Kovalev and Gennady Golovkin. But he's an American, right? And his tone that he took about all of this stuff going on with Eddie Hearn, I found really interesting because it came from a perspective of somebody, came from the perspective of somebody that didn't have a horse in the race. Because, and this is just a quick observation, there are at least three different factions of boxing, of English-speaking boxing fans that I run into. You have like the United States based Gennady Golovkin fans, right? The European American guys that root for and, you know, where Gennady Golovkin, Sergey Kovalev, Lomachenko can do no wrong. Right. Those type of boxing fans, you know, the ones that were, you know, the phony, the phony boxing fans that (laughs) would support Manny Pacquiao and were big time behind supporters of Manny Pacquiao win in the lead up to to Floyd Mayweather. Right. That type of those type of guys, right? They have been noticeably absent from in my from what I can see on my page from this discussion about Anthony Joshua, because the second fra- the second group of people that I've seen are the UK avid Anthony Joshua fans, who I affectionately consider, you know, taking the words from Blood Boxer, you know, Anthony Joshua snooker and dart fans. Right. The 90, the, the the people that would actually get up there and pay for those nosebleed seats in the UK. Right. And who are just probably new to boxing or whatever. But they're they're into that Anthony Joshua. They're into that Anthony Joshua frenzy that that Eddie Hearn has 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 managed to kick up. Right. And then there are basically hardcore American boxing fans being the last group. And that is divided between African-American boxing fans and Spanish-speaking boxing fans, right? Those are, the, those are the groups, the three large groups. And there are other ones, right? But the ones that, that really would be supportive of Anthony Joshua in the United States are the African-American fight fan who would support him, and then the, the Spanish-speaking fan base who who really who might not necessarily just have a horse in the race but really love boxing and right cuz the the spanish speaking communities you know mexicans puerto ricans might not have a horse in the race with anthony joshua deontay wilder but because it's a heavyweight boxing and it's real legitimate world championship boxing they're going to be supportive of that because they're boxing fans in general so when you have the the approach that eddie hearn is taking has isolated him, isolated Anthony Joshua from the co- from the group of fans that might actually support Anthony Joshua, which are black boxing fans in large part in the United States. And because it's a he- major heavyweight event, the Spanish speaking crowd in uh, fight fans who are probably the most who are the two most active fan bases in boxing in the United States. And as we know, the the boxing in the United States, because it's such a because this is such a large place. I mean, you can this one state of Texas has state of Texas and state of state of Texas is bigger than the UK is. So Anthony Joshua really has managed to galvanize a state. Right. If you look at it in, you know, compare the size of things in the United States to the size in the UK. But the thing that Anthony, Deontay, Anthony Joshua has, I mean, excuse me, Eddie Hearn has done by playing this game and what the game was, according to this channel, he said that he had actually spoken to Deontay, Anthony, uh, Eddie Hearn and Eddie Hearn never intended to make this bout um, until 2019. Never intended to do it because he's like, it's not big pay-per-view in the United States. It's not big pay-per-view yet. Neither one of these guys are stars. I mean, it's that's not any new news. It's not news because the cat had already because Eddie Hearns, everybody knows Eddie Hearn ain't trying to make the bout. The the, the, the tension comes around the fact that Eddie Hearn is trying to blame Deontay Wilder for not making the bout, trying to have his cake and eat it, too. 
If you're going to, if you, we know, you know, we know Eddie Hearn doesn't want that bout. He never asked for it. And he's coming up with these ridiculous conversations with, with him and Steven Espinoza. But, but, but Eddie Hearn is trying to save face for Anthony Joshua at the same time. Because nobody is going to buy a heavyweight coward. Nobody's going to buy that. And I think the mistake that he's made, and I might be wrong, but I think that the mistake that he made is that he's isolated Anthony Joshua from his own, from Anthony Joshua's potential fan base. Because while, you know, the yuppies and the teeto, the you know, the yuppie dark throwing snooker players, shout out to blood boxing in the UK are going to follow all that nonsense that they're not going to do that here. You know, like I said, the Sergey Kovalev fans, the Gennady Golovkin fans, first of all, there's not that many of them. You know, there's not that num- num- that's not that many anyway. Those type of guys are watching golf, they're watching tennis, they're watching foot really, they're watching football, college football, baseball. They have plenty of sports, plenty of sports over here to pay attention to. So they're not really going to be into boxing unless it's they're going to follow the lead of the avid boxing fan in the United States. And by I and by coming across the way that Eddie Hearn has come across and the and the stamp of like you could argue whether or not try to justify whether or not Anthony Josh was a coward or not, but you can't deny that people are calling him one. Right? It might not be a fact that Anthony Josh was a coward, but it's a fact that people are calling him one. And a large number of people are calling him one. That's you know, that's not gonna increase the the interest in Anthony Joshua, Anthony, if Anthony Joshua is going to try to try to face, if he faces Alexander uh, Povetkin and that's on the zone, who in the world is going to buy Alexander Povetkin and Anthony Joshua on the zone? Al- Anthony Joshua's numbers are lower than Carissa Shields in the United States. Nobody's going to pay for that. They, I mean, they might watch it. But they're not going to try to think, you know, oh, I want to support Anthony Joshua by by signing up with for, a, you know, three hundred dollars over the course of 12 months because I get to see Anthony Joshua fight Alexander Povetkin. And then when you got hardcore boxing fans in the United States and people ask about Anthony Joshua, you know what they're going to hear from thousands and thousands of them? Oh, yeah, that's that coward that turned down 50 million dollars because he didn't want to fight because he didn't want to fight Deontay Wilder. Who? Let me show you a picture. Yeah, it's the it's the it's the guy holding the tennis racket with the big cheese with the big big cheesy Sambo grin. <laughs> anyway, man, it just hey, you know, you can be smart. You can try to be a smart aleck, you know, calling people names and you know Pinocchios and all that nonsense. But at the end of the day, man, you're tearing down the brand that you want to build in the place that it really does matter the most. Now, Anthony Joshua can continue to fight over there in the UK, man. Keep on doing it, man. You be the biggest selling cat in the UK. You be that huge fish in a small pond. But if he wants to come over here, man, uh, Anthony Joshua has done himself a – Eddie Hearn has done Anthony Joshua a tremendous disservice, man. You know what I mean? And one that he didn't have to do, man, because honestly he could have just shut his mouth and not made the fight. But by trying to get into petty arguments with Steven Espinoza and all that, that's – I guess you could say that's why I said I think this dude's the Adrian Bron- he's the Adrian Bronner of uh of boxing promoters. Cuz he he's constantly drawing attention to himself but not in a good way. Nobody believes the stuff that's coming out of his mouth, man. And you got well-established knowledgeable people who are flat out calling him a liar to his face. And that's never good. But anyway, it is what it is and with that, I'm out. Peace. <laughs>